I've been involved with IAS and IFRS for um, a great number of years, uh, probably over 30 years, um, in various capacities, and 10 years of which as Secretary General of the old IASC. The, some of you might not even remember the old IASC, but the predecessor body to the IASB. And I was very tempted in those days, going around the world as Secretary General of the IASC, to uh, make a presentation about some of the myths and realities of the then ISC. It's too late to do that now, and I would have probably talked about different things, but it has struck me that there's a lot of myths around about IFRS and the IASB, and I thought I would take this opportunity to address some of them, because they affect us in various ways. Um, they affect um, us as academics, in that, uh, as, as I'll point out, some of the myths seem to recur in academic literature or affect some of the outcomes of academic research. Uh, and I'll touch upon some of those as I, as I go through. They affect the way people look at um, IFRS, whether it's regulators, whether it is um, other bodies. Earlier this year, I gave evidence to the Parliamentary uh, Panel on Banking Standards, which issued its report um, this week, and it had been, was suffering from, in various ways, myths about uh, IFRS, and I think probably several of us have put it right on one or two things which I'll come back to. And they also affect the issue we're looking at today, which is SME reporting, um, whether we're looking at it in terms of European directives, UK company law, IFRS for SMEs, or whatever that there are some myths affecting um, all of this. So I want to um, look at some of them. I've actually changed the title of this presentation from the one you have in the program very subtly um, because the title of the program said debunking, uh, or rather debunking the myths, and I thought, well, I'm only going to deal with some of them. Um, I mustn't claim more for this presentation than is justified. So I'm going to go through a few myths. Um, some of them originate from various, or they originate from various sources, some in the academic literature, some from uh, practitioners, some from the big four firms, some from companies, some from regulators, and some from the IASB, uh, we will see. So let's start with what I think is a first myth, which is, if we look back to 2005, the transition to IFRS changed the accounting for everything. Uh, and I'm going to focus mainly on the UK because I realize that obviously the effects in different countries might be different. But the effects of that transition varied from jurisdiction to jurisdiction and from entity to entity. In fact, if we focus on the UK, the transition from UK GAAP to IFRS didn't change the day-to-day -day accounting for transactions or the accounting for day-to-day -day transactions, it did have one or two particular effects. So, for example, there were major effects on derivatives and hedge accounting, because in the UK we hadn't got standards on accounting for derivatives and, and hedge accounting. We had disclosure standards. There were changes on share-based payments, because probably nobody got a standard on share-based payments prior to the ISB issuing its standard. And there were some changes on business combinations um, and goodwill. And there are some very, very detailed changes which affect particular companies. So, for example, SPEs might or might not have been consolidated under UK GAAP uh, and IFRS and so on. Lease classification may have changed because the words were different. But I was involved in two or three studies in looking at the transition and you know, the one thing that constantly struck me was that the change from UK GAAP to IFRS did not change the basic numbers in most companies' financial statements. I interviewed a whole load of companies on the effects, and it was fascinating that they would say, well, the only number we had to change was this or that. Revenue numbers didn't change, cost of sales didn't change, a lot of operating costs didn't change. We stopped amortizing goodwill. Um, we had to do something with our derivatives and so on. But a lot of things didn't change. And that's also true, incidentally, going back to the Parliamentary Banking um, Commission. It, it's also true of the banks, which is something I talked about, I think, two years ago, that there is a myth uh, 
that on the transition from UK GAAP to IFRS, then accounting by banks changed significantly. Well, it didn't. Loan loss provisions were basically the same. They were actually more prudent under IFRS than UK GAAP. The basic model was the same. The accounting for the use of mark to market really didn't change uh, in banks. So the first myth, as I say, is that the transition to IFRS changed everything. Well, that's simply not uh, suggested uh, by the evidence. And that may have implications in, in various ways, particularly for academics in looking at the effects of the transition. I've seen various studies of what might have been the benefits of moving to IFRS and what the effects were. And it hasn't surprised me that some academics have found it difficult to see any capital market effects. And it hasn't surprised me because the accounting didn't actually change. So why would you expect um, it to have uh, some effects? There may be some things where there's an effect, um, but um, it was remarkable how little uh, did change. There was a lot more disclosure. Everybody will tell you that. And the book's a lot longer. But a lot of the accounting, surprisingly, was the same. If we look at what's happened since 2005, then I guess a myth would be that the use of IFRS since 2005 has changed everything, changed our accounting for everything. And again, that's not the case if one looks <coughs> at um, what happens. No IFRS has been issued since 2005, which has changed the, day, the accounting for day-to-day uh, transactions in any material way. Uh, if we look at what's been issued from 2005, there's a lot of disclosure standards. They've clearly had an effect, which may have capital market effects. Uh, and IFRIC has issued interpretations which have had very narrow effects on particular companies. So, for example, uh, IFRIC 14 on customer loyalty program affects the way British Airways or Tesco account for their customer loyalty programs. Um, but it doesn't affect the way they account for most of their day-to-day -day transactions other than the effect of those uh, loyalty programs. Now looking forward in the sense of looking to the future, uh, we may get some big effects because we've got a, a, a series of standards coming into effect uh, this year and uh, in the next sort of two or three years. We've got IFRS 9 on financial instruments, which may or may not apply from 2015. We've got IFRS 10, 11 uh, and 13, which apply under IFRS from this year, 2013. You can delay 10 and 11 uh, in, under IFRS adopted in the EU for a further year. Uh, and we should have what I assume will be IFRS 14 on revenue uh, within the next few months and potentially they could have some significant effects but again my experience is from talking and listening to people and running IFRS courses and so on is they won't actually change things for the great majority of companies IFRS 10 for example on consolidated financial statements has a new definition of control which potentially changes what is and what is not a subsidiary. And I run IFRS courses and you go around the room, 20, 30 people, and say, well, do you think this will affect you? And the answer is very often no. 90% are saying no. Because most group structures, most parent subsidiary relationships are in fact quite straightforward. Where IFRS 10 will have its effect is on the more complex arrangements where perhaps we're dealing with SPEs or structured entities. So Deutsche Bank, for example, has already said it's going to have to consolidate uh, more. Uh, or it may affect the de facto control issues, but they are the minority of cases. And if you look at the typical structure of even the largest companies in this country, then they've got pretty straightforward parent subsidiary relationships. They may have one or two which are odd and they need to look at more closely. If you're heavily involved in what you might call joint ventures, which IFRS 11 now calls joint arrangements, uh, then you may have some effects. So BHP Billiton in Australia has announced some very significant changes as a result of IFRS 11. 
But if you're not involved in joint ventures or joint arrangements, or if the ones you have are straightforward, then the chances are there won't uh, be, uh, be any major effects of that change. And even if you are heavily involved, depending on the choices you've made under IS31, then you still may not have um, any changes. There's a proposed IFRS on leases, and that will have a significant effect on pretty well all um, lessees, because it will mean bringing all but the shortest of leases onto the balance sheet. So a lot of operating leases, whether they're for aircraft or coffee machines, uh, will need to come uh, onto the balance sheet. The coffee machines might not on the grounds of materiality, um, but the principle is that they, they, uh, they would. So that's potentially got um, a big effect, but only, of course, if you're involved in leasing. Uh, we had an ex have an exposure draft on insurance contracts, a second or third exposure draft on accounting for insurance contracts this week. When that eventually becomes an IFRS, if it does, it will have a significant effect, I understand, on many insurance companies because they issue insurance contracts and that's the topic it's covering. And it's long been felt there's a need for better accounting in that area. But it won't have any effect on any other companies. So looking at sort of these um, three myths uh, about the, the extent of change, I've perhaps sort of come back to it at the, at the end as well, but really to emphasise that in moving, particularly here in the UK, from UK GAAP to IFRS, hasn't had the volume of changes in accounting that many people suggest that it has had. And if you look at many of our largest companies, they're doing things in exactly the same way as they might have done. Some of these new ones may have slightly bigger effects. But it also means when we come to look at the SME issue, I actually feel that um, probably what SMEs will finish up doing in accounting terms, whether it's under the directives, whether it's under FRS 102, uh, 102 or, or whatever, probably the accounting won't be that different uh, from what they would do um, under IFRS. So the whole extent of the change is, in my view, being uh, exaggerated. Why? Well, maybe there are consultants and accounting firms who want to generate business, so they will get their stuff out quickly. And we can see that happening in the US. We can see the extent of change being exaggerated uh, in the US. So let's look at something else. This number four, this is one I've dealt with here before, um, two years ago. The myth that IFRS requires fair value measurement for all assets and liabilities at each reporting date. And I keep reading this. I keep reading it in academic literature. I keep reading it in submissions to various bodies, all sorts of places, even stuff from the big accounting firms. And yet every time I look at a set of IFRS financial statements, then 95, 98, 99% of the assets are measured using a cost model. Even when we look at the financial statements of banks, then, I mean, it varies depending on the complexity of the bank, but you can often find with a bank that 60, 70, 80% of their assets are measured using a cost model. So I don't know why it is that people keep going around saying that IFRS require fair value for everything because it is totally untrue. Now, I, that either means that everybody's getting the financial statements wrong, and IFRS really do require fair value for everything, but nobody's doing it, or people are getting it wrong in saying that IFRS do require it. And I think if you look at IFRS, there is an awful lot of uh, historical cost model accounting um, in those standards. But if you look at the financial statements of any large company, look at its tangible assets, look at its intangible assets, look at its financial assets, its financial liabilities, virtually everything in those financial statements um, is um, on a cost model. There's one or two sort of exceptions to that. But this is not only um, people outside are misunderstanding it. The ISB is not helping this as well, which I'll come back to in a moment. 
With respect to this myth, it is worth emphasizing that although, as I say, it is a myth that IFRFs require fair value measurement for all assets and all liabilities at each reporting date, it's undoubtedly the case that IFRS have increased the use of fair value measurement to record non-cash transactions. But that's not the same as requiring fair value measurement at each reporting date. It's simply a way of getting the asset or liability into our books in the first place. So we look at business combination accounting. We've gone out and bought another business. We have somewhere or other to reflect that in our consolidated financial statements. Under UK GAAP and under IFRS, we bring the acquired assets and liabilities onto our consolidated balance sheet at their fair values at the date of acquisition. And those fair values are subsequently used in effect as cost or deemed costs for the accounting going forward. We don't have to update the fair values of acquired intangibles at every reporting date. We don't have to update the fair values of acquired property at each uh, reporting date. But there is no doubt at all, in my mind, that the, the ISB has addressed several issues where there are non-cash transactions and has concluded that fair value is the best way of measuring them. And I suspect that's the case generally under UK GAAP, but UK GAAP, for various reasons, hasn't addressed um, all those particular issues. So fair value measurement at each reporting date for all assets and liabilities, no. Fair value measurement for recording non-cash transactions at transaction date, yes, that has probably increased and increased in certain ways. And there's certainly more disclosures um, about fair values, particularly about financial assets and financial liabilities, but that's not the same as measuring everything um, at fair value in the balance sheet. This takes me on to the next myth, and this is, this is really an ISB myth. Um, this is the myth that under IFRS there is no cost model. And yet, if one actually looks at the framework, but, and the measurement part of the framework is still the original part written in 1989, and I admit to playing it a, part, a part in that, and I admit responsibility for some of the weaknesses in it, that in fact we didn't actually say a lot in 1989 in the measurement part of the framework. But we did actually come up with a statement which says that we can't decide between the different measurements I suspect the ISB may have the same problem, actually. Um, but in 1989, we couldn't decide whether we wanted a historical cost approach or a current cost approach, which we were talking about at that time. But we did come out with an empirical statement, which was IFS financial statements are most commonly <coughs> prepared in accordance with an accounting model based on recoverable historical cost. And uh, we must actually give the credit to a Frenchman who is on the steering group for including the word recoverable in it. Um, and the framework defined historical cost, and if we actually then look at IFRS, then what they will do is in fact explain how you use that recoverable cost model for different assets or liabilities. So IS16 deals with how you apply that model for property, plant and equipment. IS2 deals with it for inventories. Uh, even IS39 deals with it for many financial assets and financial liabilities. But the problem is you can't get the ISB to admit to this. The ISB will not actually admit that there is such a thing as a consistent cost model uh, across its standards. If we look at IFRS themselves, if we look at things which the ISB issues, if we look at what it's suggesting that it might say in its discussion paper on the new conceptual framework, there is a great reluctance to admit that there is such a thing as a cost model and that there is, in fact, a great deal of consistency between the way in which we account, for example, for property, plant and equipment, for intangible assets from inventories and so on, which I'll just suggest in terms of a slide. This is my sort of one-page, one-slide attempt to summarize the recoverable cost model for assets under IFRS. Uh, the left-hand side, as you look at it, is the definition of an asset in the existing framework. 
as a resource controlled by an entity as a result of past events from which future economic benefits are expected to flow from the entity. And under the cost model, we measure that asset at the, uh, its cost, the consideration given for that asset, whether it's cash or the fair value of non-cash consideration. We use a deemed cost in some ways. So, so for example, as I said, the non-cash transactions, we have to get, find some other way of getting it a cost. And then at subsequent reporting dates, what we do is we adjust that cost number for the extent to which we've converted that asset into other as assets, uh, in particular into cash or cash equivalents, or we adjust it for the consumption of the economic benefits embodied in it. That's what depreciation and amortization are. We use rules of thumb to do it. We use straight line methods and so on. Uh, and it's a pity we use different language, different words in IS 16 for property, plant and equipment than we do in IS 38 for intangibles. That's the British seem to be the problem there. Um, the rest of Europe's all right. They just have one word, whether it, you, whatever that word is. But we seem to draw a distinction in this country between depreciation and amortization. It's a totally meaningless distinction. But people feel very strongly about it. I feel strongly it's meaningless. Um, and also when we look at assets under the cost model, for every single asset that can arise under IFRS, which we measure under the cost model, we have to address the issue of impairment. That if in fact we've lost some of those economic benefits that were embedded, embodied in the asset, then we have to adjust the carrying amount of assets so we don't actually carry it more than we expect to get back. And that's true whether it's probably planted equipment, intangibles, whether they're deferred tax assets, pension assets, anything. That's what we do. Again, it's a great pity the language uh, is different. So I think, uh, I, I did a presentation a few months ago, tease somebody from the ISB um, who'd been responsible for writing IFRS 13 on fair value measurement and saying, you know, well, why can't you write an IFRS 13A or an IFRS 14? which is on historical cost measurement. Uh, but they won't. Um, and they are very reluctant to admit to the fact there is something called the historical cost uh, model. And that is a great pity. Uh, they did produce a piece of research. I think this really came from the FASB, where they were working together on the conceptual framework, when they produced this infamous paper which says that there are something like 20 different measurement models in IFRS. It is, that is utter rubbish, and that's being polite. Um, I would hope any paper like that wouldn't get through an academic review process, but maybe it might. Um, but it actually ignores the fact that you're having to apply the cost model in slightly different circumstances. But in fact, if you actually look at those 20 different models in that paper, 16 or 17 of them are this basic model just applied to different sorts of assets or in different circumstances. So that's got one thing off my chest. Let's talk about prudence. <laughs> I think before I retire, I might write a standard on the cost model. I'm not suggesting that um, the cost model is the right answer for everything, but at least we ought to recognize that, well, we use it a great deal. Let's try and write down what it is and look at it. Now, prudence. This is another myth. IRS, IFRS has resulted in the end of prudence. This was certainly something which came up at the uh, Parliamentary Banking Commission and, and elsewhere. What is true is that the 1989 framework defined prudence in a particular way, and the ISB has taken out that paragraph in the um, framework. So that old paragraph in the 1989 framework, which, which was reflected in several standards as well, Define prudence as the inclusion of a degree of caution in the exercise of judgments needed in making estimates required under conditions of uncertainty such that assets and income are not overstated and liabilities are not understated. So it was to do with exercising caution when you're having to make estimates. And we do have to make estimates uh, in doing this. The ISB has taken that out. And if you look at the basis for conclusions, you can see that the ISB thinks that people think prudence is the smoothing of profits. And that comes across very strongly. 
Uh, they, the ISB seems worried that if you keep those words in, people will then start trying to smooth uh, their profits. But actually, when we look at what most accountants understand by prudence, then most of it, if not all of it, is, is still reflected within the standards themselves. Now, that begs the question as to what we do understand by prudence. So I sort of asked a series of questions. We haven't got time today to do a straw poll on this, but I did do it actually a few weeks ago. So when we talk about prudence, what is it? What is it we're talking about? We, we throw this word around, prudence is gone. Okay, well, what was it? Or who was she? Um, under the old framework, it was the exercise of a degree of caution when making estimates under conditions of uncertainty. Is that what we're concerned about losing? If the answer is, if that's all we're concerned about, then I think the ISB would put it back. But is it other things? Does it mean stricter tests for the recognition of assets and income than the tests for the recognition of liabilities and expenses? In practice, we've actually got that right the way through IFRS. And I actually think it's the only way you can do things because liabilities are things you have to pay and therefore if you've got an obligation to pay, it's a liability. Whereas assets are always uncertain things because they're these rights to future benefits. Does it mean using only the cost model? Well, maybe that's what you mean by prudence. Does it mean recognising impairment losses on all assets? Um, certainly something I would agree with, certainly something which a lot of companies seem to resist. Uh, does it mean the recognition of all known losses? Well, that's a phrase that's sometimes used, but what do we mean by known? Uh, needs a bit of fleshing out. Uh, does it mean restricting the use of the fair value model? Uh, does it mean excluding unrealized profits from profit or loss? Does it mean the creation of secret or hidden reserves? So I'm not going to answer all those questions, but uh, next time you think of saying that prudence has been taken away by the ISB, just please explain what you mean um, by prudence. So I think when we actually look at this, uh, if we look at what prudence does mean in IFRS at the moment, yes, that paragraph's gone from the framework, but throughout the standards, there is the notion of exercising caution when making estimates uh, under conditions of uncertainty. That's reflected in IFRS 13 on fair value measurement, IS 19 on the pension standard, IS 37 um, on provisions. Stricter tests for assets and income recognition than liability and expense recognition. Yes, that runs all the way through um, uh, the standards. IFRS al uh, allow only the cost model for many assets or liabilities. They require the recognition of impairment losses on all assets. They require the recognition of all losses uh, incurred on or before the reporting date. Um, we could have a discussion about incurred. Uh, and they require the use of fair value measurement but for only some assets or liabilities. So if your understanding of what is prudence is those things, and that's still in IFRS. The paragraph from the framework has still gone. Before we leave that subject, just let me deal with two things that, in a sense, aren't in IFRS. The first is the smoothing of profits and losses. That's never been permitted by uh, IFRS. The old ISC stuck its neck out in the late 70s, before my time, probably before most people's time, actually, um, by saying that banks should not have hit hitting reserves. So the, the ISC and the ISB have had a long history of not permitting the smoothing of IFRS. It's illegal in IFRS, in UK GAAP true and fair uh, financial statements. The banks in the UK did smooth their profits up to the end of the 1960s, but they didn't have to show true and fair view, and didn't. Um, and also there is uh, a, a very interesting paper from the European um, Accounting Advisory Forum, which is the predecessor of the Accounting Regulatory uh, Committee, uh, from the mid-1990s, when we were still having the, or we were having the <coughs> debate about prudence then, and it does remind us that being over-prudent wouldn't comply with the fourth directive. IFRS don't really talk about realised profits, so if you define prudence as excluding unrealised profits from profit, then um, you, you may not be happy with what's in uh, IFRS. But IFRS doesn't define realised profits, under UK GAAP and company law, they're defined in a totally circular way. 
Uh, and there is this wonderful 200-page document from the Institute of Chartered Accountants defining realized profits, um, which goes round and round and round in circles. And if I spent a few years on the old ASB's committee, which looked at SORP, Statements of Recommended Practice. And if you look at the Statements of Recommended Practice for uh, investment trusts and um, the other things, OICs, the... Uh, and so on, all, all investment vehicles, they're required for tax and other reasons, and company law reasons perhaps, to distinguish realised and unrealised profits. And each of those sorts goes on for 50, 60 pages of immense detail and artificial rules as to say what is and what is not realised. And all this is against a background of clever people in investment banks who can surely create, make a, an unrealised profit realised by some very simple process. Myth seven is another ISB myth, which is the IFRS financial statements are general purpose financial statements. Well, if you then look at the objectives of IFRS financial statements in the framework, they're not general purpose uh, financial statements. They are special purpose financial statements directed at the needs uh, of investors and creditors in capital markets. Now, to my mind, this matters because the ISB and some of the people associated with it then go on and start saying, uh, other things as a result of this. For example, if you look at the basis for conclusions in IFRS for SMEs, it says that these financial statements are not used to support the tax return, which comes as a great shock to a very great number of people in the accountancy profession who do, in fact, um, use financial statements in support of a tax return. So even in, in this country, as I'll explain in a second, um, there is uh, a link. So it's, I don't so much have a problem with uh, the notion that the objective of IFS financial statements is to provide information that meets the needs of investors and creditors in capital markets. I do have trouble with the notion that they are therefore general purpose financial statements and that other things are not then done with them, which as I say then has implications for other things. As I say, it's particularly important in terms of tax because uh, this is, a, as I say, another ISB myth, but it's a myth, actually, or pick up a myth in the academic literature. The myth that the purpose of financial statements is not to support uh, the tax return. But in a great many jurisdictions, financial statements are used as the starting point for the measurement of taxable profit and tax liabilities. And we use exactly the same financial statements that are used for some other purpose. And there is this great myth in the academic literature, which has gone on for years, which is that there is no link between financial reporting and tax in the UK, which again is something which comes as an immense surprise to practitioners. Academics have sort of convinced themselves, or some academics, have convinced themselves to believe it. Um, but practitioners just can't sort of understand what you say, because if you go to UK tax law, it's the Finance Act in the late 1990s, but in fact it was true before then, then the Finance Act requires all UK entities, not just companies reporting on the UK GAAP or IFRS, to use IFRS or UK GAAP accounting profit as the basis for the measurement of their taxable profits. They, they have the choice because they've got the choice of reporting, many of them have got a choice between reporting under UK GAAP or IFRS, but the great majority in their legal entity accounts are probably doing UK GAAP. So the starting point for measuring tax liabilities in the UK is your UK GAAP accounting profit. And that means that UK accounting standards have actually had a significant effect on the measurement of taxable profits. There are differences, there are reconciling items for things like depreciation and disallowable expenses. But if you look at the big numbers that affect taxable profits, revenue is the same uh, under UK GAAP and for tax purposes. It's rare that there are adjustments on revenue. There was a big fuss 10, 15 years ago when a, an interpretation here in the UK emphasised that accounting firms, among others, had to use the percentage of completion method for revenue, measuring revenue on services they're providing. And accountants were horrified that they had to do that. Um, they'd run out of cash. Um, so they seem to say. But also, if you go back, if you know, you're getting somewhere near my age, you might remember the beginning of 
uh, accounting standards here in the UK. And one of the first standards in the UK was SSAP 9 on stocks and work in progress. And that had a significant effect on the way in which UK companies measured stocks or inventories as we now call them. A lot of, in, prior to that time, I think a lot of companies only included direct costs, didn't include any overheads. And SSAB 9 required UK companies to include overheads in the measurement of their stocks or inventories. And that therefore increases their stock valuations, inventory valuations, and therefore accelerates the recognition of profit in a sense. Um, and I remember accountants complaining at the time that why were companies having to pay more tax, or pay their tax earlier actually, um, because of this accounting standard. And if you go back to the original text of, IF, uh, of, of SSAP 9, there was actually an appendix in which the then Accounting Standards Committee um, had been in touch with the then Inland Revenue to sort of deal with the consequences of the adoption of this standard. So the notion that UK gap doesn't affect tax was proved um, not to be true um, as long ago as the mid-1970s uh, with that. So there is, as I say, a, a myth about this uh, purpose of, uh, of financial statement. So what um, does this mean? Just let me sort of finish off with sort of one or two observations to sort of bring it back um, to, uh, to SMEs. Uh, and I suspect in many cases we find that actually there's not much difference for SMEs than for others other than in the uh, volume of information. I start from the premise actually that SMEs should uh, prepare high quality financial statements that meet the needs of the particular users they, they have in mind. And it may well be a range of users. Uh, but when we then look at financial reporting requirements, that they should reflect the nature, size and financing of the entities. Uh, those requirements should reflect the costs and benefits to the entities and the users of those financial statements. But also, those financial reporting requirements should provide a bridge between your accounting profit, which measures the performance of the entity in a way which is useful to shareholders, creditors, and I suspect management, and the profit measures you need for other purposes, the taxable profit. Accounting practitioners are well used to doing a reconciliation or a tax computation that links accounting profit to um, taxable profit, two or three adjustments in practice in the UK. But also you could do the similar sort of thing for accounting profit and distributable profits. Now the chances are at SME level you've probably got the same number anyhow. Uh, potentially there are differences um, in, uh, in larger entities. But I would actually also sort of go back to sort of pick up some of point in a sense from the previous presentation is um, certainly here in the UK I would start from the fact that all entities ought to be keeping good accounting records um, and then the preparation and presentation issues become uh, quite straightforward. And to sort of link all of this to the, the myths that I've been talking about, as I say I suspect that a lot of the accounting for day-to-day -day transactions would finish up being the same whether you are an SME here in Uxbridge or whether you're Glaxo down the road on the near Heathrow Airport, that uh, you'd be recognizing revenue and costs at the same time. Um, and there wouldn't, in fact, be, be, a, be a great deal of difference. And in practice, neither one of them is using a lot of fair value measurement. And both of them are using the same set of financials, or the, the equivalent sets of financial statements to measure their tax liabilities and to measure other things as well. So what I hope I've done in this presentation is draw attention to what I think are some myths, some things I've clearly believed strongly about, uh, but with the thought in the back of my mind that really we're maybe over-exaggerating some things uh, some of the problems with IFRS and therefore overstating the problems um, in, in using them at, at different levels. Thank you. <laughs>